Yes. Dane, excuse me, I'm sorry. Before you get into that, could you just introduce yourself and tell us all yes. who you are for the people yeah, who listen sorry, to the recording those, and don't know yeah, you? Yeah, my, a little bit of a bio here. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm with the website geoengineeringwatch.org, uh, Michael Murphy and myself. There's a few of us that are part of that site. I have a background with Bechtel Power Corporation in renewable energy. Worked on one of the first solar commercial solar plants in the continental U.S., um, my home was on the world's largest renewable energy magazine. That's how I got onto this issue. Uh, I'd been told about it, but it was frankly very skeptical. And when I moved to Northern California, expecting clean air uh, with with a very large, completely off-grid home, uh, and and started to lose on some days 50, 60, 70, even 80 percent of my solar uptake from these intermittent grid patterns. Clearly, something was wrong. Something was going on in the sky quickly came on the subject of geoengineering, and my life has been on hold ever since, uh, over a decade. Prior to this, I, I, uh, my area of, of study and research was um, climate change and the atmosphere, and that, of course, tailed right into this. And uh, So this is uh, the, the majority of what I've done for the last 10 years. Not a battle I wanted in any sense, but one I just simply felt uh, if it was not stopped, nothing else would matter. I feel that more than ever today. And if, if on the temperature anomalies we see, um, I'm sure everybody's seen these wild swings in temperature, and it's, it's very apparent now they are doing massive manipulation with the jet stream in conjunction with the aerosols. And uh, my conclusion on that, and we can go into Q&A here in a minute because I, I like that best anyway, but um, I believe that the planet is in full-blown meltdown I'm not an Al Gore fan. I'm not a carbon credit fan, but that does not change the reality on the ground. Geoengineering is appears to be, from my research, the largest single causal factor. We've been not very kind to the planet. I don't think anybody can argue that one. But, but geoengineering is by far the largest wrench in the works that appears to have triggered climate feedback loops. One of those feedback loops is methane expulsion, which appears to be um, completely released or, or triggered at this point, and um, that in conjunction with the shredded ozone layer is certainly a result of geoengineering. Uh, we are in uncharted territory, and the, the methane expulsion is not a century-long event. It's not a decade-long event. It happens over the course of a few years, and it, 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 all available data indicates it's happening now, and this is a global game-changing event. And the paradox is, uh, again, geoengineering appears to be one of the largest single causal factors, the largest causal factor, because geoengineering alters wind patterns along with HARP, which then alters ocean currents. Now we have ocean currents that used to turn south from the Atlantic before they went into the Arctic. Now they go straight into the Arctic. That's part of the reason the methane hydrates have thawed. Shredded ozone, another reason they've thawed. And so as the methane releases, uh, many people might have heard the methane is 20 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. But in fact, that's over a 100-year time horizon. Over a 10-year time horizon, it's over 100 times more potent. So uh, the magnitude of this cannot be overstated. And the reservoir that's releasing in the East Siberian shelf of the Arctic is massive. And it, it, it has the potential to extinguish life on Earth, that reservoir alone. So um, again, the paradox is the, the more they spray, the more they apparently feel they have to spray in order to cover up the damage they've already done. It's, it's painting us straight into a corner, but it's all they know how to do. It's all they're, they're geared to do. It's, it's what their uh, money-making bonanza is. So um, anyway, I, I feel at this point, and I'll go into Q&A here in a second, that, that we are really at the apex here, and the temperatures are changing radically. There's temperatures in some places in the Arctic, right, in, in the last... Uh, 30, 45 days that have been 50 degrees above normal. And there's huge swings. There's other areas that have been below normal, like Alaska. But it just depends on where they're ice nucleating, which if anybody doesn't know what that is, it, it appears that almost every precipitation vent now is being ice nucleated. That's chemical nucleation. It's a chemical process by which snow can be created at uh, according to the patents we have, of up to 50 degrees. We see the same thing happening on the ground. Shouldn't be snowing at those temperatures, obviously, but as this nucleation process continues, it appears to cool the air mass below it temporarily. And in Northern California, we had temperatures as low as 20 degrees below uh, some two, two, three weeks back, uh, not far from where I live. 
and now we're uh, up pushing 80 degrees. And uh, same thing, Atlanta, a little over a week ago, Atlanta, Georgia was 85 degrees. Uh, it snowed three days later. People should really question this, obviously. And uh, the nucleation process appears to be their last card. We don't know what's in these chemicals. We're seeing very anomalous snow that stays frozen. And um, ponds that are packed with this stuff that stay frozen long after freezing temperatures are gone, the chemical nucleation process appears to continue on actually gassing some of the water out of those ponds. They're doing over Siberia right now. is completely buried in snow. Um, the radar, we can see the ice nucleating. You can see what was a rain cell that flashes out the snow as it's, it's got this material dumped on it. So anyway, um, I'll go to Q&A, but I, I believe right now that what they have triggered is so cataclysmic, and, and paleo data backs this up, paleoclimatic climatic data, um, that they now are in total desperation trying to cover up what they've helped to cause and now the stakes are as high as they could be. And even to, to put this in perspective, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, AMEG is the acronym, a lot of geoscientists there, uh, Ken Caldera is one, if anybody's familiar with his name, but their latest proposals to stop this methane are to use the ionosphere heaters, which are the hard facilities around the globe, and try to use opposing frequencies to nuke the atmosphere in, in a desperate and, and completely destructive attempt to degrade the methane before it completely saturates the atmosphere. So this is total desperation mode, and I, I think that we're all in for quite a ride from here. But I, my belief from all my research is that if, if they don't stop geoengineering, if they don't allow the planet to respond, if they don't allow the hydrological cycle to resume, quit poisoning the boreal forests, quit shredding the ozone layer, if they don't allow the planet to respond to its own, I believe our our future looks bleak indeed. Dane, it was just a couple months ago I first heard about the methane issue. I'd never heard that before. And uh, could you explain how that works to people who've never heard about that? I think a lot of people have not even heard about that before. Methane. I mean, how, did, how, are they, how is the spraying actually facilitating the methane release in a positive feedback cycle? Uh, again, you know, there, uh, I, I, I can't in, in good conscience, hang it completely around the neck of geoengineering. I mean, we certainly have done great harm to our planet. But that being said, it does appear that geoengineering is the single greatest causal factor. Again, there are certain issues that are crystal clear scientifically. The geoengineering particulates shred ozone, period. There is absolutely no debate scientifically about that fact. We have massive northern and southern hemisphere ozone holes, really all available data, points toward geoengineering being the cause, not CFCs, not chlorofluorocarbons, but uh, geoengineering as they've been at this for about six decades, and that's about the time the ozone holes, really, uh, southern hemisphere started to develop, northern hemisphere shortly after. And um, so you have more of the sun's thermal energy penetrating the atmosphere now. You have, although they can create, and they do, with between HARP maneuvering the jet stream and the ice nucleated particulates and the simple blocking of the sun, they can and do create massive cooling events over huge areas. But it absolutely appears to be at the cost of a much worsened overall warming. So it truly is cutting your nose off to spite your face. And as they alter, as I mentioned earlier, they, they alter wind currents, which alters ocean currents. Now you have warm water going to the Arctic. Methane is the greatest source of carbon uh, that has the potential to release from the atmosphere, bar none. And this one reservoir alone in the East Siberian Shelf is thought to contain some 10,000 gigatons of methane. It's this frozen methane on the seafloor. If only 60 of that 10,000 gigatons released, that would increase by 400% the total greenhouse gas to date. Only 60 of that 10,000. So you can get an idea of the magnitude of that if any significant percentage of that reservoir releases, it's, it's game over on planet Earth. So um, I don't think they can hide this for long. It's changing temperatures by the day, and I, I think uh, they will try to spin geoengineering into some last-ditch save-all, and it's important that enough people understand it's not a cure but a curse so that when they try to sell this to us, people will already know better. But that's how the methane is released. It's been happening for... Many decades, Bermuda Triangle, that's methane release, not aliens. When, this, when these methane 
fields release, it aerates the ocean like a bottle of champagne. Ships have no buoyancy, they go to the bottom. So this has been happening for a long time. Uh, but the Arctic uh, reservoir is very, very large, and it's also acidifying the ocean. As the methane releases, much of it dissolves in the, in the seawater as it reaches the surface, and the oceans are acidifying right now at breakneck speed. So this is a multi-edge sword, and uh, none of it good. Okay, so... So to make this simple for people, they're shredding the ozone layer. More sunlight is reaching the methane depots or these methane uh, reservoirs, and then the methane is being released, causing a further heating, which is then increasing. It's acting like positive feedback and just increasing the the whole cycle. Is that basically right in a nutshell? Yes, but it's more of the sun's thermal energy. It's not necessarily direct sunlight because, again, uh, global dimming right now, another term many are not familiar with, is... Um, fully 20% on planet Earth. That means over the last five decades, 20% of the sun's direct rays no longer reach the surface of the planet, again, a result of geoengineering. So, I mean, the the amount of decimation being caused by geoengineering, it can't be quantified. Again, it's shredding the ozone, altering wind currents, releasing methane, poisoning everything that lives, the boreal forests, which are the lungs of the planet, the northern latitude forests, Siberia, the Pacific Northwest. I, I mean, I... I spent my life in the forest, and, and it's, it, it looks absolutely horrific. I just came in prior to making this call, and the devastation is, is uh, it's cataclysmic. And so now you have these forests that were the lungs of the planet that were a carbon sink that absorbed carbon. Now they are a carbon source. They're emitting carbon because they are dying. So, uh, I mean, there's nothing that's not being harmed by geoengineering. It is harming everything. But the sun's thermal energy, Russ, uh, again, is not... Uh, always in the form of direct sunlight, and it's like a cloudy day on the beach. You know, you can still get sunburnt. And and another part of this feedback loop is the Arctic ice cap. Many people, the global warming debate rages on, and it, and it really should not. Um, although there is a small section of Antarctica that has, in fact, increased the sea ice slightly, and that, we fully believe, is from ice nucleation, areas that it did not snow before, did no precipitation because it was too cold, the, water, the, air, the air didn't contain enough moisture to, to precipitate. Now it does have enough moisture. It is precipitating, and there's sea ice forming, but that doesn't mean it's getting colder. It's not getting colder. And in the case of the Arctic ice cap, it almost completely imploded this year. Media is not covering this. It, during most of the melt season, the Arctic ice cap was losing 100,000 square kilometers of surface area a day. Near the end of the ice season, the melt season, it was 130,000 square kilometers a day. It's not expected to last more than two or three more years. No ice. Again, back to the methane. You, instead of the surface of the ice reflecting 90% of the sun's thermal energy, now the sea absorbs 90 plus percent of that thermal energy. So add that increased absorption of sunlight from the open seawater, add the ocean currents that are now delivering warm water, add the increased thermal energy from the sun, from the shredded ozone, Bad mix, bad combination, methane releases, causes heating, more ice melt, more absorption, positive feedback loop. Very, very clear, easy to understand. All right, let me, let me ask you some hard questions uh, real quick, because I know this people, everybody is asking themselves this, and they respect what you think, um, and they, they'd like to know what you, what you think, I think. Um, uh, how long until this process affects every soul on Earth? You know, How long until it's a, an actual, an, a, you know, something that nobody, even the people who are trying to deny most and go on with their lives, have to deal with? I, I, based on the data I see, I, I, I don't believe they'll be able to hide this past the end of this year, um, perhaps not even that long. And I, I believe that the ramifications from this event are unfolding so rapidly that... Um, I, I feel it's a, a, certainly a strong probability that uh, some event might be um, laid on us to uh, to, to just distract from everything unfolding. You know, maybe maybe they'll start World War III, maybe a false flag event or something. This is purely speculation. I have no knowledge of that, obviously. But ba- based on the ramifications of the imploding environment, and, and, and again, to put this in a little more perspective, uh, Russ, the species extinction rate today is somewhere between 100,000% of normal background extinction 
and a million percent of normal background extinction. That's between 1,000 and 10,000 times normal background. We're losing as much as 200 species a day. Uh, we are in the sixth great mass extinction on planet Earth right now, today, and you can't hide that for long. You have uh, fish stocks imploding. 93% of global pelagic fish stocks are uh, now depleted. 93%. The, now, now the bottom of the food chain, mackerel, herring, uh, those are just starting to implode now completely. Um, the, the previous methane mass expulsion, okay, we have a paleo data to go on here. From 55 million years ago, the PETM event, Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, was a methane mass expulsion event. And it's felt that there was about, you know, it depends on what model, what study you look at, but uh, as, as much as 70% terrestrial extinction and perhaps over 90% ocean extinction. So, you know, this is no joke, and, and uh, it's going to change. But, but again, if we stopped, if they stopped geoengineering, that is our best chance. That, you know, we, they can only hurt the Earth's climate systems that are trying to compensate for what's happening. But when they see the atmosphere, they stop cyclonic rotation, they stop ozone regeneration, they thwart the hydrological cycle, they poison what rain that does fall. It's doing nothing but harm. Geoengineering needs to stop. Uh, you said a word about the docks. Pelagic, is that what you said? Uh, pelagic fish populations. Those are those are the the greatest food stock fish. You know the tuna, the mackerel. The, uh, those are pelagic fish. Okay, so that's we're we're losing that on a massive scale right uh, now. They're they're 93 percent depleted globally already. 93 percent. I mean, they're the only reason they catch anything is because their fishing methods are so incredibly sophisticated. But you have the ocean acidifying at the same time, um, in addition to Fukushima radiation and you know a thousand other things. But um, ocean acidification is is um, happening per, perhaps uh, a thousand times faster than the Petum event I just mentioned 55 million years ago. So we are on a, a jet engine ride to a, a whole new reality. And and again, I, I I know my message is very dire. My conclusions are very dire. But um, first, it has to matter to us to to uh, try to raise awareness on this. For every single individual we reach, that has to matter in and of itself. That that makes the effort matter. And two, um, it, no one can say how this will unfold. No one. And, and again, our best, best bet by far is for the planet to be allowed to respond, for people to understand what's happening, and not for these uh, completely clinically insane people to fly untold thousands of jets around day in, day out, and completely thwarting all of Earth's life support systems. And that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah, I have to say that I agree with your, I know it was just speculation about probably they may have a distraction uh, or false flag or something that will distract everybody. That's, that's putting all the pieces together, I have to agree with that speculation that that's probably what they're going to do. Now, so by doing chemtrails, by, by doing this so-called geoengineering, it sounds like they're, they're obviously making the problem worse. Can't help but to believe they know exactly what they're doing. What do you think? They know they're making it worse, but maybe there's some reason behind it, well, or, or any no, th any I, I thoughts on it, that? I, I think there could be a couple angles. I mean, I think that uh, in one on one hand, they know it's going to collapse, period, and so they don't care. Um, and, and I always have to bring up the issue of 1,800 plus nuclear detonations on planet Earth. I mean, what what sane a uh, group of people would do that. I mean, exposing themselves absolutely positively is strontium-90 in all of our bones. You know, everything was contaminated from those 1,800 detonations blowing up beautiful South Sea islands. Why would anybody do that? I mean, you know, there's no sanity in this equation, certainly. But I, I believe, and having spoken to Ken Caldera and, and uh, having uh, spoken to David Keith uh, at the Geoengineering Conference in in San Diego, that um, from my perspective, um, I, I don't think there's a lot of uh, rational thinking in this equation. Not at all. They live in bubbles where they, they you know, the, the, the consequences of their actions don't appear um, to be relevant to them. And so we're, we're dealing with, um, in my opinion, uh, a complete lack of deductive reasoning here with no comprehension as to the consequences of their actions. So 
it's hard to say, Russ, but I, but I believe also that the vast majority of people involved in these programs, the vast, vast majority, have no idea what they're doing. They, they are being told they're doing something that's going to save the planet, something benevolent, something necessary, and those are the people we need to reach. Those are the people who need to understand that they are sucking the noose around their own neck along with the rest of us. And, and I would hope that once they realize that, they would refuse to participate in this insanity. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, you had mentioned, um, uh, we can go to Q&A in just a second, but a couple questions I've heard from a lot of people. Um, we keep seeing this pattern of um, there's, everything is dying. I had uh, four different vegetables die off during two weeks of intense spraying um, uh, this summer. I have a garden. I've learned gardening the last three weeks, which I love. And uh, all, of four, all of a sudden, four different vegetable types, just they all died. And uh, it, was, it, sink, it came right with two weeks of uh, spraying. You just mentioned you came in with a, I guess you're working with a dozer. You're seeing the decimation of forest. What are you seeing with uh, the plant life there, and how is that going to play into this? Again, you know, the, the geoengineering is, is the elephant in the room. It's, it's the, the main cause of decimation in, in many, if not most, uh, forested areas right now. Back to the species extinction, as much as 200 species a day going extinct, this is, and this is the important factor of this, it is thought that 70 to 80 percent of those extinctions, plant and animal, are fungally related. So when you poison the soils, when you saturate them with bioavailable, toxic, deadly, heavy metals, you kill the soil microbes. You kill the life of the soil. And what moves in when there's a clean slate? Fungus. And fungus is decimating everything from the oak trees to the, to the uh, some of the conifers and uh, you know and every other thing from top to bottom including people fungal sinusitis epidemic now fungus is a very slow insidious um, problem and it's 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 absolutely connected the decimation of the forest certainly we're seeing die off we're seeing trees that are weak when trees uh, and many other organisms sense, when their roots sense bioavailable aluminum, there's studies on this in particular, so I'll use aluminum as an example, but they shut down to protect their DNA from damage. So they, they don't uptake nutrients, so they die a very slow, protracted death. And in the case of the forest in the Pacific Northwest, everybody says, oh, it's just the beetles. The beetles are only a symptom of a weak tree, a tree that has been poisoned. So, you know, all roads lead back to geoengineering. Again, uh, I mean, uh, if, if they had not been doing this for 60 years, I believe we would be in exponentially better shape. Now, it doesn't mean that we haven't damaged the planet. Again, that, any notion that, uh, that that has not occurred is, is just not looking at reality. But, but geoengineering, I believe, the biggest single causal factor, and if they had never started this, I, I believe we would be in, in a much better position. But as it sits right now, um, we are in free fall to an unknown reality. Okay, and you mentioned the, bio, uh, the biologically available aluminum. Now, soils naturally have a lot of bauxite, which, I, which they get aluminum from through manufacturing process. But that's completely different because that doesn't affect the plants the same way newly introduced, free, biologically available aluminum does. Is that correct? That's completely correct because it, this comes up so many times from these, these geoengineering disinformation sites and people and, and um, that aluminum is 8% of the Earth's crust, and it is. But aluminum does not exist in the environment in free form, period. Always bonded to other elements, not bioavailable. It certainly doesn't blow around in the wind as they have tried to claim. You know, when I, when I first dove into my research here, I, I talked to a... a hydrogeologist, one of the first people I talked to, and he was aghast at the, the aluminum reading I had in my rain and said, you know, you shouldn't have anything, you know, even one part per billion in your rain unless you live next to an Alcoa factory. Those his words exactly. My first test in the rain was seven parts per billion of aluminum, already very high considering where I live. Subsequent tests over the next six years rose as much as almost 50,000% from that already high reading to 3,450 parts per billion in a single rain event. I mean, this is highly toxic rain. Snow, where this aluminum accumulated off the side of Mount Shasta, has been measured as high as 61,000 parts per billion. Uh, and nobody's talking, and people know, Russ. I mean, I, I've talked to NOAA scientists six months ago, off the record. They, they absolutely know. I, 
I just had another meeting with the environmental waste in Northern California. They have, you know, tests from the Sacramento River that are spiking in aluminum, but they're afraid to say anything. And it's like, you know, everybody's worried about their eight to five job while we're all sinking at breakneck speed uh, into total extinction, literally. So I hope if we can reach critical mass, and academia knows. I mean, I don't think there's a meteorologist out there that doesn't know this is going on, or or a biologist that's involved with any type of forestry issue and if we could just break the dam I think it would break from a hundred different directions okay can you hear me now yep gotcha sorry about that go ahead who do we contact it seems almost impossible you know you can't get the legislators or senators to do anything you can't you know what should be our next step once we're aware and you know wanting to fight it extremely important question and uh, I would say this, legislatively, we will never get anywhere. The system's bought, sold, paid for. They've been setting it up for this for many decades. Um, I think they truly believe they could carry this on in, indefinitely. Um, it could not be further from the truth. So the, the entire system is rigged not to show these particulates. So we need to reach the people and not waste our time with agencies. And everybody can do that from their own home computer. Find groups that would care if they only had a clue, farm groups, um, environmental groups, ADD, Alzheimer's, autism. Um, some of the big fishing organizations are wondering why their streams are, are, are all dying. You know, the, 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 the list is almost endless of people that would care if they had a clue. Get credible data. Uh, send them a credible email with a couple good articles. I call these flaming arrows. We all need to be shooting these flaming arrows from our from our home computer. Journalists that focus on environmental issues to, you know, uh, but something very thought out, credible article, site for more data, uh, geoengineeringwatch.org, our site is, is one site. Uh, even get an address and put an article or two in there. Uh, that doesn't cost much to do. And we all, the, the, since there's so few of us, the best thing we can do is to try to start these spot fires with people who are absolutely personally being horrifically affected and would care if they really got it, if they really uh, accepted this was going on. And, and to add to that, I would say they will no longer have the option of denying this because I don't think this lump will fit under the rug much longer. So even if it doesn't start an immediate fire, it'll smolder there. And when they start to see everything imploding around them, I believe uh, those seeds will find fertile ground. So we can all, from, if there's an organized campaign to locate groups, organizations, and individuals that would care, journalists, if they knew, and, and send out data. Just keep sending it out, you know, and, uh, and mail films, uh, make copies of Murphy film, but what, 25 cents a copy for a DVD or 50. Uh, just continue to shoot out those flaming arrows. With the few of us there are, that's the most effective thing we can do. So is it okay to have the government monitor social media conversations and then to wade in and correct some of those conversations? With more on this, let's go to technology expert Carmi Levy. He's on the line from Montreal. Carmi, uh, do you think the government's monitoring what you and I are saying right now? Is this whole thing getting out of line or what? What, is the, what exactly is the government's aim here? And what do they hope to accomplish with what they find out? And as they accumulate this information online, this data on us, um, um, you know, where does that data go? Uh, and so, you know, I think uh, as much as we should applaud the government for getting into this area, the optics of it are potentially very big brother-ish.